Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Solving Confusion with Regulations, QC Design, and Troubleshooting for SARS-CoV-2 Assays. I am Jen Woods of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Technopath Clinical Diagnostics USA. For more information about our sponsor, please visit their site at technopathclinicaldiagnostics.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I'd like to now introduce our presenters, Sten Westgard, Director of Client Services and Technology, Westgard Quality Control, and Sharon, Dr. Sharon Ehrmeyer, Professor Emeritus, Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, University of Wisconsin-Madison. For a complete biography on our presenters, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Ehrmeyer, you may now begin your presentation. Well, thank you, Jen. I am Sharon Ehrmeyer, and today we're going to be talking about uh, the coronavirus. And this uh, slide shows, uh, of course, the virus that we've become very familiar with, and then where we were on December 4th, uh, 2020. And uh, we can see that at that time, there were 67 million global cases and 1.5 million deaths. It is really something, and, and I can just imagine what it is today. Uh, it just grows and grows um, unbelievably fast. Now, we're going to be talking a lot about emergency use authorization, these EUA tests. And I find this to be very confusing. So I thought I would look uh, EUA up and see what uh, would come up. And um, the definition states that in emergencies, uh, certainly which uh, COVID is an emergency, and when no products are available on the market, the EUA legally permits the FDA to authorize unapproved medical products, and so this is a whole bunch of things, to diagnose, treat, prevent serious or life-threatening diseases, conditions caused by chemical, biological, radiological, and or nuclear events. So that's what the EUA is all about. It's, it's a way to get them out from the manufacturer onto the market. And then if we look at EUA testing for the laboratory, uh, oh my gosh, it's just absolutely overwhelming. There are so many tests. And I stopped at the end of October. And uh, what I have up here on the screen uh, just shows some 300 tests to choose from. And again, if you were to go to that today, the website that I have, uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, there will be more. So I really feel for test sites uh, on selecting the appropriate test for their situation. Now, what do we do in terms of testing? And I can't emphasize this uh, enough. Really, you always have to check with CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which really, uh, you know, this is where we get the CLIA regulations from. And remember that CLIA sets the minimum. Certainly, if you are accredited by, say, the Joint Commission or COLA or the College of American Pathology, um, they can do and require more 
but you uh, need to follow what is appropriate for you. And again, this is just like the testing. There's so much information out there that it's very easy to get lost in information. So what I have done today, or what I have done for today, is to prepare some charts. So if you look at this chart here, on the left, the, the leftmost column, I have the testing requirement. So for instance, in the first row, uh, it states it's a CLIA certificate allowing wave testing. Do you need one? That's the, the question actually. And for CLIA, it says yes. For COLA accreditation, yes. And the same is true for the Joint Commission and CAP. So that's just the beginning. I have uh, several of these charts. And I have done a series for wave testing. And, uh, you know, this is probably the largest category of testing out there. And I have included the requirements for CLIA, COLA, the Joint Commission, and the College of American Pathology. So let's uh, go ahead and look at uh, some of these in more detail. So the first red circle here, uh, the requirement is specific testing requirements for wave test methods. Now, just like in any other wave test method under CLIA, there are really no requirements other than to follow the manufacturer's directions. And that's absolutely true for the uh, emergency utilization authorized tests as well. For COLA, yes, you have to uh, follow um, the manufacturer's directions. That's always the cardinal rule in testing. But then you also need to follow the applicable uh, WAVE standards in their current accreditation manual. So if you are COLA accredited, you certainly have access to their manual and you can just go to that section and follow those requirements as well. As for the Joint Commission, again, you need to follow the manufacturer's requirements, but this time you follow the WAVE testing standards in there, meaning the Joint Commission's current comprehensive laboratory accreditation manual for laboratory and point of care. And then lastly, the same thing is true for CAP, but now you need to follow the uh, applicable standards in their current checklist. And again, if you're CAP accredited, you're really familiar with those checklists. And uh, the ones that I have specified here are the uh, general, the all common, and the point of care. So going on, uh, what about quality control? Now we're still in the wave testing category. And uh, for CMS, CMS, who again uh, is responsible for the CLIA regulations, you have to follow manufacturer's directions. And if we look at COLA, the Joint Commission, and CAP, all of them say, yes, you have to follow the manufacturer's directions for quality control, uh, and you have to perform this quality control at least at the frequency of the manufacturer's directions. Now, what they are really saying is you may decide to do more, and that's fine, but the minimum is the manufacturer's directions. And if you look just at the bottom uh, of that red circle, the requirement is to develop and follow uh, site-specific IQCPs, and that's an individualized quality control plan that I know that many of you are very familiar with. But for wave testing, no, there is no requirement for IQCP because it's very clearly stated you need to follow the manufacturer's directions. And so you can't reduce that at all with an IQCP. 
So this is, uh, I've been following the common questions uh, that come in on, on various uh, frequently asked question and answers for all of the organizations. And I think that, again, since CMS is the bottom line developer for QC and IQCP, it's good to see what they say. So the question is, can a lab develop an individualized quality control plan? And uh, CMS says that manufacturers quality control instructions for all uh, EUA testing must be followed, and this includes QC. And it goes on and says, because QC for these EUA tests must be followed, and no deviations to the QC requirements are permitted, then an IQCP is not applicable for this type of testing. Now, note that the laboratory director may determine based on risk uh, assessments, and that's a big part of IQCP development, that additional QC needs to be implemented above what is required in the instructions, but nevertheless. And then going on with the requirements for wave testing, what I have circled here is mandated personnel training and competency assessment, and certainly these activities uh, would be documented. Well, just as we would expect for CLIA, this is not a requirement because it's not a requirement uh, in any wave testing. But I think that those of us in the testing business for any period of time, we realize that it may not be an actual requirement if you're being uh, inspected by CLIA or, and not going with a, uh, a professional organization. We realize that it may not be required, but it certainly is essential as part of good testing practices for quality test results. Uh, COLA, Joint Commission, and CAP all require training and competency assessment, and they really uh, uh, follow the same requirements as they uh, require for any other wave testing. This would be non-EUA requirements. So just to uh, reiterate this, CLIA, there's none, but you better do some. And for the three organizations that I have listed here, all require training and competency assessments, and you would do what's in your accrediting manual. Okay, what about this training? And I just want to give an example. Now, this comes out of the Joint Commission, so this is really only relevant to those who are uh, accredited by the Joint Commission. And uh, it's listing here uh, some requirements for staff performing wave testing. And so, you know, it really shows that the difference here from uh, accrediting organizations uh, putting on more demands to the testing process compared to CLIA, uh, which has no requirements. Many good things listed here, and the other organizations have good things as well. Okay, we're still continuing with the wave testing for the EUA requirements. And uh, the question here, the requirement here really is, are there policies and procedures to train personnel collecting the patient sample, including training? Now remember, uh, in some cases, depending upon the test actually being used, the collection uh, can be quite unique. And so uh, do these uh, people doing just the collecting, not the testing necessarily, but for the collecting aspect, is, uh, are there requirements? And CMS, as you might guess, 
uh, does not mandate anything. But again, I'm saying it's really essential for quality test results because our results are only as good as the specimen we receive. COLA has requirements for people collecting the specimen. Joint Commission has requirements. And CAP has requirements as well. The next requirement, um, method performance specifications. Uh, that means do we have to uh, verify or validate the test before we put it into use? Now remember these are wave tests, and so again, CMS says no, not a requirement, but of course it doesn't require this for any of the wave testing that is done in the laboratory. Where COA, Joint Commission, and CAP have uh, some minimum requirements. And really what they say, and I think COLA is a good example here, yes, to the extent required by the manufacturer and or organization. And when we're talking really about the organization, you know, the director is always in charge. And so it'd be up to the director then to decide uh, if, uh, um, performance specifications need to be checked. Now, looking at the second circle, this is uh, about reporting the results. And it doesn't matter what the results are. They could be the molecular results, it could be antigen, it could be antibody. The uh, idea is if something is run and the result is intended to detect SARS, uh, COVID-2 or diagnose uh, COVID-19, uh, th then it has to be uh, reported to the appropriate health authorities. And that typically is uh, in the state that you live in. But make sure that you uh, find out specifically where these results have to be reported. And if you've been following this requirement at all, um, you will realize that there's a lot to be reported. And uh, I can tell you that it seems like many testing sites have really been uh, balking at all of the things that have to be required uh, or have to be included within this reported result. So make sure to find out about that for your particular situation. Now, uh, I don't in the previous slide, and I can go back there. Notice under CLIA, I have down here uh, item um, 493.41 of the regulations. And I thought, well, you know, I really better look that up to see what's going on. And um, this has just been inserted. Uh, this is why it's really important that you have to go to the website that I have uh, listed on the bottom there, that really long, ridiculous website. And what they do is that they do upgrade um, uh, uh, the CLIA regulations on a regular basis. And I just did this a couple of days ago. And it says very specifically, you know that it wasn't there originally because it cites the public health emergency. Each laboratory that performs a test that is intended to detect or diagnose a possible case must report the test results to the secretary in such a form and manner and at the, such time and frequency as the secretary may prescribe. So uh, you need to uh, uh, look into the public health department uh, in your state to see uh, how to go about doing this properly. Okay, now we are going over to non-waived testing. So the wave testing done at point of care, uh, very popular in terms of the choices for the number of uh, for testing that can be selected for testing at point of care. Non-waived, uh, there are some uh, 
more, um, uh, I don't want to say onerous, because that's not the case, but more requirements uh, applicable to non-wave testing, just as with all the other testing that we do in the laboratory. So um, the first thing that falls under this red circle it, uh, is asking about follow requirements for specific CLIA testing specialty and subspecialty. And remember that when you look at the CLIA requirements, there are some general requirements, but then there are specialty requirements. For example, chemistry and hematology, but then we also get into the infectious diseases. But in truth here, there are no special requirements here because these tests have not been assigned a CLIA specialty and subspecialty area. So there's nothing that we can follow or no place that we can be directed to for the regulations. And you'll notice that that's what CLIA says. And then, of course, COLA, Joint Commission, and CAP follow. Going on to quality control, daily quality control, still the cardinal rule about following the manufacturer's directions. And just like in wave testing, um, you have to do at a minimum following the manufacturer's directions. But uh, COLA, Joint Commission, and CAP says, hey, listen, you have to do that, but you can do more. Well, then the next requirement gets back into developing and following site-specific IQCPs. And that would be the thing, again, that the site would decide whether they wanted to develop an IQCP. I read you back several slides ago that CMS said, no, not necessary. You have to follow the manufacturer's directions. But interestingly, all three accrediting organizations do allow IQCPs that go beyond following the manufacturer's directions. But this becomes very confusing. And if you want to develop an IQCP, because remember, normally we d develop an IQCP to reduce the amount of QC. We don't want to do QC daily when we follow an IQCP. So all I can say is no for CMS. If you want to develop an IQCP and you're accredited by COLA, the Joint Commission, or CAP, to make sure to contact them to see if this is really the right thing to do. Now, moving on, and we're still looking at the non-wave testing, uh, we talked about performance specifications for wave. Do we have to verify or validate them? And, and the answer for um, waved is generally no, but we can. Where here now, we're in the non-wave category, and CMS says, Yes, you need to do this, and you need to follow all the applicable CLIA requirements that are uh, that uh, you normally would do for all the other non-wave testing performed in your laboratory. And the same is true for COLA, Joint Commission, and CAP, and they all have their own requirements uh, to do that. And then this last circle here, uh, this is asking about proficiency testing uh, in a CMS-approved um, regulatory PT program. And CMS says no. Uh, these EUA tests are not assigned a specialty or subspecialty, so therefore they're not included in regulatory PT. But the, you know, just in uh, other cases of testing, uh, if we're not in PT, then we perform some alternative accuracy assessments for those tests not in regulatory PT. Now, for COLA, Joint Commission, and uh, CAP, it's really the same requirements as CLIA. Uh, but again, you follow your accrediting agency's 
uh, appropriate requirements. And they all state that if you're not in regulatory PT, because there really uh, are none, then you need to perform alternate accuracy assessment. And for instance, we know um, that CAP has some uh, proficiency testing samples out there. In my state, Wisconsin, they run a, a, a proficiency testing program and they also have uh, proficiency testing samples. And you can use the data uh, from analyzing uh, this type of sample uh, to assess accuracy. Now, I want to look one more time at competency assessment. We looked at training, and certainly for um, non wave testing, everybody doing the testing has to be trained uh, prior to doing the test, and they also have to have their competency assessed. Uh, on a regular basis. And CMS is very specific, and all of the other organizations follow what is required uh, for competency assessment. So I have listed uh, the six things that need to be accomplished uh, on this particular slide. And so it's no different than any other testing. Um, you just do the same for EUA testing. Well, what about when this is over? And boy, I'm sure for all of us, it can't be over uh, uh, fast enough. Just a reminder that when EUA ends, I'm assuming when the pandemic is under control, uh, uh, these tests that are out there will need to go through the regular FDA approval. So regulatory life will return to pre-EUA uh, times. And all CLIA, COLA, and the Joint Commission and CAP regular, regulatory testing requirements um, that we use for everything else in the laboratory will apply to these tests as well. So um, when it's over, it's over. And for me, it can't be over soon enough. Here are some references for you. There's so much information out there that I really uh, cannot stress enough that always check with the organization that you use for the regulations. These people really do want to help you succeed. So with this, I want to thank you for your attention. And now I'm going to turn it over to Stan Westgard for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, it, we really get a, a good idea of how the regulatory landscape has shifted during this time of emergency. And clearly the regulators have had to make changes to adapt to the EUA era. It will be interesting to see what happens when we go away from emergency use. But in the same sense, we have to think about what is happening to quality control. What happens to quality control when there is an emergency. Now, I'm just gonna back up a little bit and, and introduce myself. Uh, this is something I have to do on a lot of webinars. Uh, when you hear my voice, you might be expecting another Westgard. That would be James O. Westgard, the father, not only of the Westgard rules, but also my father. And while he has been working in laboratory medicine for 50 years, I am the junior employee. I have only been doing this for a little over 25 years. A lot of what we've done during the uh, pandemic era has been about trying to inform as many people as possible about qualifying and selecting the best quality methods. 
and we put more than a dozen articles up on our websites. Uh, our, our most popular website is westguard.com, more than 68,000 laboratory professional members, more than a million views on the, on the homepage every month, more than 600 articles on non-COVID uh, topics, but uh, more than a dozen directly related to uh, SARS-CoV-2 testing. One thing that Sharon noted earlier was uh, how many tests had come onto the market so fast in order to address the, the dire urgent need for diagnosing and, and characterizing infections. The QC has sort of followed behind. It's lagged behind the introduction of these methods. And so QC has been not really spoken of. What is emergency use QC? Well, no one has really defined it. One of the goals that I'm gonna have for this part of the presentation is to, dr to try and bring to bear some sanity to how we're gonna do QC in our emergency use era and once we return to regular use. And we're gonna walk through a couple examples of QC failures that we've come across with different SARS-CoV-2 tests. And we'll even provide a few troubleshooting tips. The thing I wanna emphasize most is in a, in a time of emergency, Quality is not something you put in the back seat. When you look at these two vehicles, do you decide only one of them requires seat belts? When there's an emergency and you're in, the, in an ambulance, do you decide, I don't need safety features in my vehicles. I don't need airbags. I don't need seat belts. It's an emergency. I just need to get somewhere fast. Actually, it's, it's almost the opposite. When you're in an emergency, that's when you need quality the most. When we have these diagnoses with such tremendous consequences for the patient, we need to be as accurate as possible. This is the time when QC is actually more important, not less. And one of the, the downsides of having so many methods come to market so quickly is that many of them are not of sufficient quality. There's a lot of evidence to the contrary that all SARS-CoV-2 methods are far from perfect. Just a couple days ago, the, uh, the WHO in their database listed almost a thousand methods for SARS-CoV-2 and this is PCR and antibody and antigen. Within the US, the FDA has only approved 227 molecular methods, 61 antibody methods, and seven antigen methods, far less than 1,000. And in fact, there are 181 antibody lists on the do not distribute list of the FDA. That is, for every one method that the FDA will give the emergency use authorization, it is denying three methods that same emergency use. So that's saying 75% of the methods on the market may not be good enough. That's a very chilling idea, and it should, uh, it, it should give you a pause you should think when I select a method, I better be extra selective because there's a lot out there that may be offered to you for cheap or for convenience, but in fact, these are bad methods and they are not gonna serve your patients well. So when we come to doing QC on SARS-CoV-2 methods, we face the same options that we would with any other method. We could use the manufacturer or package insert ranges. We could use full Westgard rules, or we could do something in the middle. 
Now, the use of package insert ranges on uh, th there's a long history of, of knowing those ranges are too big. They're probably too wide. They'll be insensitive. They won't pick up errors, but they do serve a purpose. And that is when you're just starting out, if you have no other information about the performance of the method, you use that package insert information first. And then once you get 20 data points, once you get a month of information on performance, you quickly switch to that. Another tradition in a lot of testing is throw all the WestGuard rules at a test. And some, some labs will throw WestGuard rules at everything. That might have been good in 1981 when the WestGuard rules were first introduced. But today, um, if we have selected a, a method with good performance, full WestGuard rules may in fact be too strict. And it may cause us to define some things as out of control or reject runs when actually the problems we're detecting have no clinical importance. What we would like to do is find out a way to choose just enough WestGuard rules as the method requires. If we don't know the performance of the method, however, if we have no characterization, we don't know if it's uh, a, a high quality method or a low quality method, in the absence of that performance understanding, using full WestGuard rules may be, a, may be a useful resort. If you don't know anything, yes, go ahead and use the WestGuard rules, but hopefully after some weeks of operating the method, you will gain a better understanding and be able to customize and tailor your use of QC rules. And what we'd like is this, this middle ground of the use of WestGuard rules. We, these days on, on methods outside of SARS-CoV-2 testing, there's a, a strong uh, practice of characterizing the method on the Six Sigma scale, and then using that Sigma metric to drive not only the rules to use, but even the number of controls to run and the QC frequency. Let's take a moment to understand how antibody testing for SARS-CoV-2 is similar to all the other tests that we have in our laboratory. First, we do have a continuous measurement signal, even though the final result may be classified as negative or positive. Under the hood, there are numbers, and we can, with controls, determine the variation of the measurement process. While in the very beginning of this pande pandemic, we did not have commercial controls, now they are available. The control vendors have caught up. You can run a third party control on a method. Those controls will have a normal distribution. And therefore, all the principles of statistical QC apply. But let's also acknowledge how SARS-CoV-2 methods are different. For antibody testing, of course, we have cutoff values. And that will, that's what we get, we, uh, that can cause us to have false positive and false negative values. So that, those areas are not the same as our continuously variable numbers that we would report to a clinician. Another challenge is that in this uh, vacuum of methods, we, in, uh, you know, nearly a thousand new methods rushed in, and many methods lack primary standards or reference methods against which they can compare. So that means a certain you know values from method to method may not be comparable. Another issue is the use of arbitrary units. So depending on how the signal to cutoff ratio is created, the manufacturer may say X is a low positive, but that same number on a signal to cutoff ratio on another manufacturer might be considered a straight positive. So that makes it even more difficult to compare methods. And of course, 
there are no standards for normal biologic variation because the virus is not normally in humans. So we don't have a natural occurring uh, biologic variation, and then you can't derive from biologic variation a specification for quality or an allowable total error. Here we start our look at real world problems being found in laboratories running SARS CoV 2 methods. And here you see it's the same instrument, same method, but two sets of controls. Uh, the top control or control A, you can see the variation is minimal, there are no outliers. According to control A, the method is fine and steady and uh, the laboratory is happy. But if you look at control D, you can see there is a persistent systemic decline. There's a systematic error that's impacting the method across the whole time period in which these controls have been run. So do you want to guess which control is supplied by the manufacturer and which one is the third party independent control? It's probably not hard to guess that control A was provided by the manufacturer. Control A was probably created with quite a bit of uh, optimization for a particular reagent lot and therefore it's not giving a real view of instrument performance, it's giving an idealized one. And that control provided by the manufacturer also gives the manufacturer fewer technical support calls. On the other hand, control B is the third party control. It provides an independent look and it has caught a, a systematic decline in the value. This is why ISO 15189 strongly recommends that laboratories run third-party QC. And in a time where not only are the methods being rushed to market, the reagents are being rushed through production. So we have reagent issues that are coming on top of method problems, and we need controls to be able to detect these problems. Because otherwise, if we see those declines and they're actually impacting patients, we, we start getting misdiagnoses. And that's, uh, and we're already facing so many other problems with SARS CoV 2 testing. We don't want to increase the number of false positives or false negatives that are going out the door. Here's another example this is a reagent shift that has been caught by a third party control. And you can see that is a major reagent shift. That is a pretty big jump in values. This is why a, re, uh, a third party control is so important. As I said earlier, we have known this. This is not news that third party controls pick up errors that manufacturer controls don't. Uh, just a, a recent article uh, by Dr. Pat Garrett. You can find it, um, you can see the link. This is MLO online, and this is picking up, happens not to be a SARS CoV 2 uh, method, but it's another infectious disease method, and it's related. And here, the independent control picks up a significant change in performance, while a manufacturer's control did not. So we acknowledge that the independent controls will help us pick up errors better, faster. But what happens once we've picked up that error? How do we actually troubleshoot the method? Are there special ways that SARS-CoV-2 methods must be troubleshooted? Or is troubleshooting agnostic about what the test is? Troubleshooting, your troubleshooting protocol can be customized to a method, but there are some things that are universal to all methods in trouble. And one of those is that there are two kinds of errors that can occur. 
One is a random error. Another one is a systematic error. And in this table, you can see that if you have a random error, the, error, the QC rules that will be violated will tend to be the 1.3s or a 1.2.5s or a 1.3.5s or an R4s. So if you have the WestGuard rules running and you see the 1.3s or the R4s most commonly implemented, when those are violated, that will help you understand, it looks like I've got a random error. Conversely, if you see errors such as the 2.2s, or the 4.1s, or the 2 out of 3 2s, or the 3 1s, or any of the mean rules, 6x, 6x 8x, 9x, 10x, 12x, different varieties of, of x rules in different formulations of WestGuard rules, when those are violated, because those are all multiple measurements on one side of the mean, they indicate systematic error. So when you use a set of WestGuard rules, when one of them is violated, that rule also tells you what kind of error might have occurred. Now you will see one rule off by itself in a completely different column. The rules I was just talking about are in a column titled high PED, which means high probability of error detection. Those rules are good at detecting random or systematic errors. The column to the left is high PFR, which means this is a rule that is very good at giving false rejections. It will go off when there's no problem. And that is the 1-2-S rule. The 1-2-S rule is known to have a high percentage of false rejections something we cannot afford in this time. We have a SARS-CoV-2 method. We can't have every one out of 10 or one out of 20 runs being rejected when there's nothing wrong with the method. That creates too many backlogs, might require too much retesting in a constrained environment where we already might not have enough tests. Now we have to burn two on one person because of bad statistical QC choices, no. Avoid the 1-2-S rule. We said that for all the other kinds of testing. It applies double for SARS-CoV-2 testing. Once you've figured out what kind of error might have occurred, such as a random error or a systematic error, well, then you're going to want some kind of troubleshooting flow chart. And I'm showing you three different kinds, one for one that helps triage between random and systematic, one that helps focus on random errors, and one that helps troubleshoot uh, for systematic errors. And, you know, for instance, uh, for random errors, you might be looking at, um, you, know, you might be asking, are, are multiple tests going wrong? Do we think we have clots? That can be a, a kind of random error, in which case you want to flush it out. Um, another random error that you may encounter is you start seeing bubbles in the reagent. And that might mean you need to change the reagent or somehow uh, flush out the bubbles. Another uh, cause of, of random error can be reagent stability. On the, uh, on the systematic front, it usually comes down to the lifespan of a calibrator or a reagent lot. As these lots come near the, the end to their expiration date, they might start to drift. And uh, we already saw an example of that earlier. It's happening in the real world. And in that case, you know, the, the, the solution is if we catch a significant degradation, well, we, that means we got to have new calibrators, so we got to have new reagent lots. And you, you may have to create some custom flowcharts that take into account those general errors that can happen in any method, but also any you know, idiosyncratic method-specific errors that could happen on your, your COVID testing method. Finally, I suggested earlier that we wanted to find a middle ground. We wanted to optimize our use of WestGuard rules. And we do that using what we call the WestGuard Sigma rules. It's a more modern uh, application of the WestGuard rules. 
It takes into account the Six Sigma benchmarking. So you have Six Sigma WestGuard rules. You put them together, you have WestGuard Sigma rules. And essentially, if you know the Sigma, then you can figure out how, how many rules you have to use. Six Sigma means you might need only one rule. Five Sigma, three rules. Four Sigma, four rules. Three Sigma, all the WestGuard rules. So if we can characterize our COVID methods on a Six Sigma scale, we know how many WestGuard rules we're going to use, and we can even figure out how often we need to run QC. Some further advice I'd like to give. Um, not all control levels are created equally in SARS-CoV-2. Um, the, the very low or completely negative control may be not so important. The low positive controls might be the most important, and you might need to optimize your QC design around a low positive, because that's where you're closest to the cutoff you're closest to a change in diagnosis, so you want to focus your uh, attention and your QC around changes taking place there. Again, complex WestGuard rules may be overkill for many methods. If you have a good performing method, uh, I would say if you, if you think you have a good method, drop off a 10x rule or an 8x rule or, or a 6x or 9x rule, because that's the most likely uh, rule that is going to be overkill and will start causing you problems. So you might truncate an arbitrary set of WestGuard rules by one, just run four of the WestGuard rules. And then if you can figure out how to calculate the sigma metric, you might be able to reduce it even, even further. Another suggestion I'll make is that as your kits change, as the reagent lots change, as you modify a sigma to cutoff, uh, point or ratio or zones, you will have to modify the allowable total errors. Essentially, you will modify your performance specifications when you see significant changes in reagent lot and adjustments in signal to cutoff. The standard of having to establish a mean and standard deviation for each new reagent lot, we do that outside of SARS-CoV-2 testing. We need to do it inside SARS-CoV-2 testing. So in conclusion, uh, just because a SARS-CoV-2 method is semi-quantitative does not mean you want semi-quality control. Our biggest challenge will be to establish a critical decision level, something like a low positive, and then figuring out a, a measurement uh, specific, uh, sorry, a performance specification or allowable total error at that level. The simplest tool we can provide you is the WestGuard Sigma rules and the WestGuard Sigma approach. And then if you want, if you have the ability to get even more control and, and a better grip around the performance of the method, then you could go ahead and start using something like OpSpec charts, another WestGuard tool to fine tool your to fine tune your QC design. I also want to note uh, some recent articles on screening assay QC by Dr. Paulo Pereira on the WestGuard website, plus a book that he has just on qualitative testing that came out uh, this year. And then thank you, thank you for attending. Uh, thank you, Sharon, for giving us a thorough update of the regulatory situation. Thank you to Technopath for supporting this educational session. And thank you to LabRoots for providing us a valuable platform. And now we'd like to turn to questions and answers. I hope you've been typing some questions in while we were talking, but if, if not, you now have the opportunity to send some questions through the Q&A and we will start answering them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stan and Dr. Ehrmeyer for your informative presentations. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. 
And let's get started. Our first question is for Sten. What are your thoughts on using real-time peer comparison data for test performance for infectious, infectious disease and other semi-quantitative tests to run uh, for run acceptability measurements? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I this is the a, a moment where having a peer group comparison is really important. If you think about how reagent lots are changing, uh, they're going to change faster than you're going to be tested on proficiency testing or EQA. So having a peer group allows you to see. Wait, I see a shift in my reagent. Is that happening for everybody, or is it just something I'm seeing? So that's a really important component, and I also might refer you, uh, there was an earlier webinar, um, Wayne Demick, uh, we did early into this pandemic, and, and Wayne Demick over at NRL, uh, he has some um, uh, peer group uh, tools that are available for SARS-CoV-2. Great. Thank you so much, Stan. Now, this is directed to both of you, both Stan and Dr. Ehrmeyer. Is there a third-party quality control material for SARS-CoV-2 antigen tests? Well, Stan, should I start? Um, uh, this is a, a good uh, question as well. And, you know, as far as I know, I am not aware of one. But remember, uh, all this is new. And so I would imagine in the future uh, there will be. What do you think, Sten? Um, yeah, I have a feeling there are. Uh, it, just as I couldn't tell you of the thousand methods that are on the market, I, I can't give you details on, on them all. Uh, I I can't uh, I can't keep track of all the controls coming to market. I would be shocked if there isn't an antigen control by now. Um, I think more more uh, difficult more difficult um, for the controls. They probably exist. It's just uh, how can you get them? Are they on allocation? Um, you know, it's the logistical challenges as with everything else in the in the EUA COVID era, um, that might be the real challenge. It's not so much that they don't exist, it's, it's can you get hold of them? Okay, thank you both for that answer. We've got another question, and this is aimed at uh, toward Dr. Ehrmeyer. <clears throat> for a waived testing system, could the lab use external controls not listed in the manufacturer's package insert? And if so, in what way should these controls be validated? Wow. <laughs> really, really, really good. Uh, first of all, remember we're talking about WAVE. And uh, certainly for those laboratories that are testing just under CLIA, um, there's nothing that's stopping you from that. But remember, you also ha always have to uh, follow what is in the manufacturer's insert. And after that, you can do pretty much whatever you want to do in terms of additional controls. Now, how should they be validated? Uh, I think initially you're going to have to go what is in the uh, product insert uh, simply because, you know, these materials that you're using for the wave testing, I'm sure you find are rather limited, so you cannot undergo an extensive uh, validation prior to implementation. But then after you use them for a period of time, you can do a statistical analysis on this and then decide uh, what uh, if you want to change uh, the level of acceptability. Now, Stan, I'm sure you probably have a comment on this, so I'll pass it over to you. Um, well, I, th this, is a, this is a scenario where, um, you know, the manufacturer is going to tell you to do something, and then you're going to use controls on top of that. Um, so, 
to me, it's, it's a rare scenario where a laboratory is using a wave system and trying to go above and beyond control, you know, what the manufacturer is saying. I mean, more power to you uh, if you do so, but uh, most of us are, if you get a wave system, you're not doing that extra level. I agree. Thank you so much, both of you, for those answers. And we've got time for one more question. I want to remind our audience that those questions we were unable to answer today and those that come in during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the email address you provided at the time of registration. Our last question is for Dr. Ehrmeyer. Regarding the IQCP not applicable for EUAs, what do you suggest a laboratory does in regards to reagent allocation where it's not feasible to run QC on every run? <laughs> you know, uh, this, this whole business about IQCP is really a confusing uh, issue. And from in my presentation, I stated uh, what CMS uh, states and that an IQCP is not uh, necessary because the mandate is to follow the manufacturer's directions. Now, if the uh, you know if the manufacturer has something built into uh, the system, uh, then that would be it. Um, to run something less than what the manufacturer uh, suggests is just not appropriate. Uh, so I would say if you're still wanting to do something differently, then for sure contact your accrediting agency and get advice from them. But remember that uh, CMS says uh, no IQCP, follow the manufacturer's directives. Thank you again, Stan and Dr. Ehrmeyer. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Well, again, I just want to thank everyone for uh, joining. Uh, thank you for the questions. There are definitely more questions, and we will be answering them, and you'll get them uh, at a later time. Uh, thanks, Sharon. Thanks, LabRoots. Thanks, Technopath Clinical Diagnostics, for supporting us. And I certainly concur with everything that Jen has said. Thank you. Well, thank you. And before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to once again thank, uh, thank Sten and Dr. Ehrmeyer for their time today and for their important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Technopath Clinical Diagnostics USA, for underwriting today's educational webcast. You can view the webinar on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. That's all for now. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>